Good morning, everybody. Uh, good afternoon. In fact, I'm very pleased to welcome you to the IIEA for this webinar this afternoon. And of course, it's a particular pleasure for us to uh, be joined today by Valdis Dombrovskis, European Commission Executive Vice President uh, for, and uh, Commissioner for Trade, who has been generous enough to speak to us today about EU trade policy post-COVID. <clears throat> This event is part of the IIEA Global Europe Programme of Webinars and Research, uh, which uh, is generously supported by the Department of Foreign Affairs and which the Institute works in cooperation with the department. The Executive Vice President will speak to us for about 15-20 minutes and followed by a question and answer session with our audience. And uh, just to say, you'll be able to join the discussion using the Q&A function on Zoom, which you should see on your screen. And uh, please feel free to send your questions in throughout the session as they occur to you. And we will come to them once the Executive Vice President has concluded his remarks. Uh, if I could request you to keep your questions as brief uh, as possible so that we can get to as many as possible uh, during the event. And we would also appreciate if you could provide us with your name and your affiliation. And uh, particularly a reminder that today's presentation and the Q&A are both on the record. And uh, please feel free, of course, to join the discussion on Twitter using the handle at IIEA. And we're also live streaming uh, this afternoon's discussion um, on via YouTube and a warm welcome to all who are joining us uh, from YouTube. Uh, just before I introduce the Executive Vice President, I would like to remind our audience that the IIA uh, will continue to celebrate its 30th anniversary throughout the month of May with a series of keynote speeches such as uh, this afternoon's and panel discussions open to all. Uh, on the pressing issues uh, which are shaping Ireland and the world. So let now let me formally introduce um, Executive Vice President Valdis Dombrovskis. He was appointed Executive Vice President for an economy that works for everybody in 2019. And as part of the current European Commission of President von der Leyen, he is responsible for financial stability Financial Services and Capital Markets Union. And he has also since October um, 2020 uh, held the trade portfolio. In fact, uh, it's as you can see, it's an extremely wide brief. And just looking at the mission letter for uh, the Executive Vice President from um, Commission President von der Leyen, the tasks outlined there run in fact to about eight pages. Um, he previously served as Vice President for the Euro and Social Dialogue from 2014 to 2019 as part of the um, Claude Juncker Commission. And prior to joining the European Commission, um, he was Prime Minister of Latvia from 2009 until 2014. Uh, he was an MEP in the European Parliament from 2004 to 2009. And um, uh, he was the Latvian finance minister uh, from 2002 to 2004 and chief economist at the Bank of Latvia, uh, monetary policy department. Uh, in addition to that widespread of, of uh, very significant experience, um, the executive vice president holds a master's degree in customs and tax administration. Uh, which will touch, um, touch um, a point here in Ireland, as well as a, a degree in economics and also physics. Um, so with that frighteningly impressive CV, Vice President, uh, may I hand the floor to you uh, to tell us about um, trade policy for the EU after COVID. The floor is yours and you're most welcome. Uh, uh, Madam Chair, uh, ladies and uh, gentlemen, <coughs> uh, first of all, uh, thanks to the Institute for International and European Affairs for organizing this event. And uh, I want to congratulate you on your 30th uh, anniversary as a foremost think tank on EU and international affairs in Ireland. Uh, I'm, I welcome this opportunity to engage with Irish audience on the subject of EU trade strategy and its importance for your country. 
let me say that Ireland is studied closely by other small European countries, including the, no, uh, the one I know best, Latvia, as an example of how to harness open trade and investment for economic development. Uh, Ireland has traditionally been a strong voice at the European table when it comes to defending an open, fair, rules-based trade uh, policy. Indeed, Ireland has based its economic development model on international rules-based trade, and now you are one of the most globalized economies in the world. The late uh, Peter Sutherland uh, was the first director uh, general of the WTO, so the Irish voice has been strong in support of global rules-based trading system. Accordingly, I'm convinced that Ireland can support the new EU trade strategy launched by the European Commission in February. Uh, the new strategy aims to be uh, open, sustainable, and assertive. Uh, these uh, keywords uh, reflect a number of lessons learned in recent years, so let me go uh, through them one by one. Uh, open uh, because we will need open trade more than ever to help us to recover from COVID-19. Exports already support one in six EU jobs. Uh, in Ireland, that figure is even higher. Uh, we estimate that one in every three Irish jobs is facilitated by extra EU exports. This is among the highest levels in the EU. Uh, Ireland also witnessed one of the highest increases in export-supported employment between uh, 2000 and 2017, estimated to be at uh, 147 percent. Uh, to build on <coughs> to build on these strengths, uh, Ireland and the EU should continue to make uh, the most of our global trade relationships. Uh, this is fundamental given that 85% of global growth will happen outside the EU in the next decade. Uh, open trade also depends on having the right global rules. Uh, this is why we have published a detailed EU agenda for reform of the World Trade Organization, and I'm engaging with a new WTO Director General in this respect. Uh, but openness in itself is not enough. Uh, trade policy needs to work in synergy with other headline policies reflecting our European ambitions and values. Uh, this is why we are putting a strong emphasis on making trade policy more sustainable. We'll pursue a number of concrete actions, including a trade and climate initiative at the WTO, uh, seeking commitments from G20 countries to uh, achieve climate neutrality in trade agreements, uh, making full use of our network uh, of trade deals to work with global partners on biodiversity, pollution, circular economy, and sustainable food systems, uh, and making uh, Paris Agreement commitments an essential element of future agreements. We also plan to propose a carbon border adjustment mechanism in full respect to WTO rules. Uh, in our bilateral relationships, we want to be uh, sure that our partners live up to their agreed obligations on trade and sustainable development, including commitments on climate and labor rights. Uh, to help in this respect, last year we appointed the first EU Chief Trade Enforcement Officer. Uh, this, uh, his mandate is to enforce uh, our uh, uh, rights and get the most value out of our trade deals for our exporters, including SMEs but uh, he is equally tasked with monitoring our deals to make sure our partners uh, honor what they have signed up to, including on climate and sustainability. This is important because we want to uh, help to reassure our citizens that European value remains at the heart of a trade policy. Uh, for example, I have noted some concerns from uh, Irish uh, uh, politicians about CETA agreement with uh, Canada claiming that it would enable co corporations to pursue legal action against states if new uh, legislation impacts their profits. Uh, let me be uh, very uh, clear. Uh, CETA fully protects the right of state and local authorities to regulate, and this applies in uh, all fields where public policy objectives are at stake. Uh, the Belgium government expressed doubts in 2019 and asked the EU Court of Justice to look into the matter. 
in its opinion, the court confirmed that there was no such risk and also confirmed that the investment court system proposed is fully compatible with the practices of judicial independence and in par uh, partiality under the Charter of Fundamental Rights. Uh, the investment court system established in CETA is a clear break from uh, the ad hoc system of private arbit arbitration known as the ESD ISDS, which exists in many bilateral uh, investment treaties. Uh, the new system not only preserves the government's right to regulate, but also makes uh, the procedures to resolve investment disputes fairer, more transparent, independent, and impartial. Uh, it is important to point this uh, out because the public deserves to have the facts. Uh, uh, there is no hidden agenda in EU trade policy. We uh, simply want it to support our workers and companies, create jobs, and work in synergy with our wider objectives. Uh, this is why we will take another important step to be more assertive. Uh, we need to strengthen our own capacity to level the playing field and to defend ourselves when our partners do not play by the rules. Uh, last week, for example, we proposed a legal instrument to address distortions by foreign, uh, foreign subsidies in our internal market. Uh, there are many other proposals being implementing or coming in the legislative pipeline. Uh, I'm uh, happy to discuss this in further detail, if you wish. Uh, finally, let me point out that the success of our trade agenda depends on strengths of our global relationships. Uh, let me focus on three relationships which are of high relevance to Ireland, the United States, the UK and uh, China. Uh, I do not need to explain to an Irish audience the importance of transatlantic relationship. Uh, indeed, Ireland, with its economic, cultural, and historical links to the US, always plays a central role in the transatlantic relationship. And I'm pleased to report that we have seen a marked improvement in our transatlantic relations with the Biden administration. We have mutually suspended the tariffs imposed in the Airbus Boeing dispute in order to see a negotiated solution. Uh, we have welcomed the US rejoining the Paris Climate Agreement. And we see uh, uh, positive perspectives for restoring EU-US leadership as an engine for positive global change. Uh, of course, the relationship with the EU and the UK is of utmost interest to Ireland as an EU member state with most at stake in this relationship. Uh, when it comes to the UK, my uh, colleague, uh, Vice President Shevkovic, is uh, responsible for ongoing negotiations, but from a trade perspective, I can, take, uh, I can say this. The uh, trade and cooperation agreement concluded at the end of the last year is uh, still in very early stage of implementation, so we lack trade data to get a comprehensive picture. Uh, however, we do see the emergence of some early difficulties. Uh, some relate to the withdrawal of the UK from the single market, which is an unavoidable uh, consequence of the type of Brexit pursued by the UK government. Uh, other issues relate to the implementation of the agreement, including the Northern Ireland Protocol. Uh, to address these issues, the EU plans to be fully solution-oriented and engage constructively with the UK authorities, keeping a calm but firm approach. Uh, I would like to reiterate the EU's commitment to making the protocol work, and I would add that uh, doing so relies on joint action through the joint bodies under the withdrawal agreement. Uh, ongoing discussions at the technical level will continue in uh, coming weeks. Uh, it is in strong mutual interest of the EU and UK to make our tra trade relationship work. Uh, finally, let me uh, briefly mention our relationship with China. Uh, as you know, uh, last, uh, late last year, we concluded negotiations on a comprehensive agreement on investment. Uh, from the economic perspective, a deal contains many benefits for European companies as it restructures the EU-China partnership to be more reciprocal, balanced, and fair. Uh, a comprehensive agreement on investment also enshrines sustainable development commitments, uh, including the fight against climate change and respect of core international labor organization principles. And this is the first time China has agreed uh, to such concessions in a deal with a global partner. 
uh, but the ratification process cannot be separated for a wider political context. Uh, EU sanctions against China for human rights abuses have led to China's retaliatory sanctions targeting, uh, for example, members of European Parliament. Uh, we will, uh, view China's actions as unjustified and regrettable and uh, not helpful for, for creating the favorable environment needed to pursue ratification. So the, essentially, the future of the deal depends on how broader EU-China relations evolve. Uh, to conclude, ladies and gentlemen, I hope I have provided a useful overview of some prominent topics in EU trade agenda, and I will happily answer your questions uh, and comments. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Vice President. Uh, that was a, a, a very comprehensive overview of where uh, the trade um, situation is at the moment with the EU. Um, could I just uh, uh, take advantage of um, my role and ask you with regard to, uh, you finished up on the uh, question of the trade and investment uh, agreement with China, which as you mentioned, uh, is not proceeding. Uh, can I ask you um, with regard to the US-China uh, situation and uh, where the EU w finds itself in certain situations caught between the two, countries um, where uh, tensions have arisen significantly. Uh, do you have any view that uh, the EU could play some role between the two countries or in fact uh, what, what um, uh, objective uh, has the US with regard to its China policy? But particularly, what is the EU position between the US and China at the moment with regard to trade? Uh, well, uh, first of all, if we look at the um, uh, state of play regarding uh, different uh, agreements, uh, US have their phase one uh, deal with uh, China. Uh, recently, uh, also in uh, Asia, there was a regional uh, uh, comprehensive economic partnership uh, agreed, RCEP. Uh, so, uh, of course, it's important for uh, EU not to be uh, only a major economy, not uh, having uh, uh, any kind of agreement with uh, uh, China. So, uh, of course, it's important that we, uh, at the end of the day, arrive at successful conclusion on comprehensive agreement on investment to rebalance our uh, economic uh, relationship. Uh, then, if we talk about um, uh, uh, US-China uh, relations and EU's uh, role on them, uh, well, we must be uh, realistic that uh, with uh, comprehensive agreement uh, of uh, investment, we will not solve all our issues in relations with uh, China. And there are uh, many uh, concerns which we are sharing with uh, US. Uh, to give some uh, examples on issues, for example, like industrial subsidies, uh, role of the state-owned enterprises and their competitive neutrality, forced technology transfers, intellectual property rights. We are uh, sharing all these uh, concerns. So actually, uh, we are uh, cooperating uh, quite closely with Biden administration to see how we uh, better address those uh, concerns, how we coordinate our work uh, uh, bilaterally, uh, also trilaterally uh, together with uh, Japan, and uh, how we also uh, address those issues multilaterally in a context of WTO uh, reform. So all those uh, uh, work streams are uh, currently uh, being uh, uh, pursued. So actually, uh, uh, we are in a very uh, constructive work and exchanges with the uh, new US administration on this. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Vice President. I just have a follow up question from um, uh, Adam Daly in the journal, uh, since we're speaking of the China investment. And he asks uh, specifically, do you see a future for the investment deal? And what are the, uh, could such a, uh, could you speak on the direct benefits such a deal would have for Irish business? Uh, that's quite specific, but um, it's of considerable interest here. Yeah, well, uh, first of all, on a comprehensive agreement of uh, investment uh, and its uh, benefits. So, uh, in a sense, it's uh, asymmetric agreement to address uh, asymmetric uh, situation. 
uh, because uh, currently uh, EU market is substantially more open to Chinese uh, uh, companies and Chinese investments than uh, uh, China's market is to the EU companies. So uh, therefore, uh, the agreement contains uh, 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 quite a few new commitments from China in terms of market access in uh, different uh, sectors, in, in terms of level playing uh, field. Uh, and uh, well, also mentioned uh, the uh, sustainable development. And it uh, actually uh, contains a very few new commitments from the EU side. Uh, it's uh, uh, basically uh, uh, we are maintaining our existing level of uh, openness. Uh, so then uh, uh, as, um, uh, 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 as regards uh, 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 benefits uh, uh, specifically from I Ireland, of course, it's uh, for uh, uh, companies in the sectors uh, which are uh, active and having new uh, market access uh, offers from China to, to evaluate exact uh, benefits. Is it uh, uh, automotive uh, sector or uh, is it uh, 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 sector in services and cloud or private uh, healthcare providers or uh, real estate or, or number of uh, financial services, number of other uh, areas where we have a new uh, market access openings, for example, by phasing out or uh, uh, withdrawing uh, joint venture requirements and uh, similar uh, uh, requirements. Uh, uh, so, uh, but then uh, generally speaking, I would say Ireland uh, benefits from uh, global rulemaking as a small open economy because it's uh, clearly that uh, especially small open economies can function uh, better in a situation when uh, where there is a, a, a agreed rules when there are uh, uh, trade agreements which uh, uh, these uh, countries can uh, explore and that goes i would say very much also uh, uh, for uh, ireland well uh, in terms of um, uh, the future of the deal i already uh, mentioned uh, that uh, from the commission side we continue to work now the technical work is ongoing the legal scrubbing uh, but uh, the next uh, steps concerning the ratification uh, we'll need to see in a context of broader eu china uh, relationship Yes, thank you for that. And just as a final one, uh, and it's asking you, I think, to look into a crystal ball, but a question from Politico for Giorgio Leali is, um, do you feel that uh, if some of the Chinese sanctions against European officials are removed, that uh, the China ratification deal might pass through the parliament? Uh, well, uh, indeed, uh, uh, as I mentioned in introductory uh, remarks, uh, that's uh, exactly uh, the now uh, problem that China imposed its retaliatory sanctions, uh, including to members of European uh, Parliament, including entire parliamentary subcommittee being uh, sanctioned. So uh, clearly, uh, this is something which uh, uh, needs to be addressed uh, in order to uh, uh, proceed uh, uh, with a ratification and eventually in order to be able to successfully conclude the ratification. Thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, we have a number of other questions. Uh, one from our former finance minister, Alan Dukes, uh, on the border carbon tax adjustment. And uh, Alan asks, has the commission modeled the effects of the border carbon tax adjustment, the proposed increases in, uh, in carbon tax uh, in, in relation to the, the trade agreements? Yeah, well, as regards um, uh, carbon border adjustment uh, mechanism, uh, the work is uh, currently uh, ongoing. And of course, it's uh, quite a fundamental issue when EU is uh, moving towards carbon neutrality. We have a commitment to be carbon uh, uh, or climate neutral by uh, 2050. Uh, and uh, it means that, of course, we cannot continue with uh, giving uh, free emission allowances to uh, energy intensive industries. But if we uh, start to phase them out, uh, obviously, we need to address the issue of carbon uh, leakage uh, to uh, uh, compensate uh, for the uh, cost uh, difference vis-a-vis uh, -vis those jurisdictions where there are less strict uh, environmental rules. 
so uh, that's a fundamental rationale of the carbon border adjustment mechanism. Well, of course, what is very important is to ensure that what we are putting forward is WTO compatible. And the uh, key word there is uh, non-discrimination uh, and uh, avoidance of double uh, protection. So we, in a sense, cannot put uh, uh, through this carbon border, border adjustment uh, mechanism uh, uh, importers at the competitive disadvantage vis-a-vis -vis European uh, producers. So in a sense, we need to ensure a, a level a playing uh, field uh, here. Uh, uh, but it's uh, I can imagine that also for other, especially advanced economies, as they are moving towards uh, 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 climate neutrality, and more and more countries are actually uh, committing to that, uh, they will have to address uh, the uh, similar issue of carbon uh, leakage. So uh, in any case, uh, 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 there will be uh, further uh, discussions and coordination of approaches uh, uh, needed. But in a sense, um, uh, 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 one can say that the EU is at the forefront of this uh, development. Thank you, um, Vice President. Um, I have a specific question from uh, which is of interest to Ireland, and it's from William Lavelle of the Irish Whiskey Association. And he asks, can the automatic doubling of EU tariffs on US whiskey imports on the 1st of June be avoided or deferred? If implemented, this doubling would go very much against the desire for de-escalation of transatlantic trade disputes. Uh, a, a, and I, a question of Irish interest, but also, of course, of wider whiskey producers everywhere. Yeah, well, uh, we are now in intensive uh, discussions with uh, a new US uh, administration. Well, this is an issue uh, related uh, to uh, 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 so-called uh, 232 uh, tariffs imposed by Trump administration on uh, steel and aluminium uh, based on uh, uh, national, uh, national national security uh, concerns. Of course, we are not accepting that the uh, US is uh, uh, treating uh, uh, EU as a threat to national uh, security, and we hope that the new administration will correct that. Uh, uh, and uh, we are now in uh, indeed in in intensive discussions with the uh, 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 Biden administration uh, as regards uh, this to see how we can ensure that uh, we actually are uh, addressing uh, in the sector of steel the core problem, which is global steel overcapacity and not so much production of steel in uh, EU or uh, US. We know that the uh, uh, bulk of the overcapacity comes from uh, China uh, instead of imposing uh, tariffs uh, at uh, each other. So uh, we are working on this uh, and of course we are uh, hopeful that we can avoid this uh, uh, next uh, uh, step in terms of our uh, uh, response uh, uh, as regards uh, the um, uh, 232 tariffs imposed by uh, Trump. Thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, from uh, We have a question from uh, Joanna Sapinska from the Melex Market Insight, and she's uh, speaking about another dispute, which is the um, a Boeing Airbus dispute, and um, she asks how advanced are the negotiations with the US uh, on the settlement? Is there still a chance that the talks are finished within the four month deadline or will more time be needed, uh, do you feel, for an agreement? Uh, well, uh, as regards Airbus uh, Boeing, of course, the first positive uh, step was that we uh, agreed on a mutual suspension of uh, uh, tariffs. Uh, indeed, uh, for uh, four months, and we're actually halfway through that time. Uh, negotiations are uh, uh, also on this area uh, ongoing very intensively. So looking at the uh, uh, future disciplines in the area of uh, large uh, civil aircraft uh, manufacturing. Um, uh, and uh, well, uh, uh, of course, we are working with the uh, time uh, uh, timeline of uh, four months uh, in mind. And in any case, it's uh, clear that it would <laughs> be uh, uh, very important to avoid uh, uh, the introduction of the uh, tariffs. So definitely we uh, must work uh, with the aim uh, to avoid this uh, scenario. Thank you for that. Uh, just moving on to an issue that is very much also in the forefront of uh, trade considerations, particularly in the context of, of COVID-19. 
uh, and that is strategic autonomy. So I have a couple of questions here, one from the Ambassador of Belgium to Ireland, and he asks, uh, could the Vice President elaborate his views on EU strategic autonomy in the context of the recovery of uh, European and world economies? And also Seamus Allen, uh, the digital researcher in the Institute, asks what are the implications of open strategic autonomy and digital sovereignty for Europe's digital economic trade? I give you those two, Vice President. Uh, okay, um, uh, as regards um, um, uh, strategic autonomy, or rather I would say open strategic autonomy, uh, we have elaborated on this uh, concept on also in our new EU trade uh, policy uh, strategy, uh, being very uh, clear that we remain open to the world, we remain uh, open to fair and rules-based uh, trade, uh, but uh, we are ready uh, to uh, defend ourselves more uh, assertively if third countries uh, or operators in third countries do not play by the rules. So in a sense, uh, we are willing to act uh, uh, multilaterally uh, whenever we can, but we are ready to act unilaterally uh, uh, whenever we must. So this is an approach how we uh, use this in, a, uh, in our trade uh, 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 new trade uh, policy strategy. Uh, then, uh, as regards as a, a question of um, uh, uh, what, what, what was mentioned, uh, digital uh, sovereignty. Uh, of course, uh, we, we once again we believe that our strength is through our engagement with the uh, world and not turning uh, inwards. Uh, uh, for example, uh, one of the uh, uh, items which we are currently negotiating and negotiating in the context of the World Trade Organization is uh, so-called e-commerce uh, negotiations, where EU mandate is very uh, clear. For example, uh, 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 being against uh, uh, unjustified uh, uh, data local localization uh, uh, requirements, some kind of a digital uh, protectionism. Uh, and uh, it's important uh, that uh, we uh, maintain uh, this uh, approach, that we are open in uh, principle and, and willing to cooperate uh, with the world. But of course, if there are some uh, uh, specific issues linked with uh, uh, security or other uh, justified uh, cases, uh, there may be a, a, a case to restrict certain activities to uh, EU only. So this assessment is also now uh, currently uh, ongoing, for, for example, in the context of our work on uh, industrial uh, alliances. But uh, uh, as I outlined, I believe that the openness is actually our strengths. Thank you, Vice President. Yes, that is interesting because I think there has been some worry among smaller countries such as Ireland that um, a strongly enforced uh, strategic autonomy might have negative effects for uh, small countries, industries, for example, and that it would promote the larger industrial complexes if we moved very far in this direction. Is that a sentiment that you have sensed uh, in your discussions? Uh, well, uh, actually, we just uh, recently uh, updated our uh, industrial uh, strategy, uh, uh, learning uh, lessons from the crisis. Also, for example, assessing the resilience of our uh, supply chains. And the conclusion was actually that our supply chains are uh, quite resilient and there is a very limited uh, uh, number of goods where uh, some some action, some intervention may be uh, needed to ensure uh, uh, more resilience uh, supplies or EU uh, production uh, uh, capacity. Uh, well, there are some industries where we want to strengthen our uh, production capacity. There are already existing uh, uh, alliances, like, for example, a batteries alliance in the context of electromobility, uh, clean hydrogen uh, alliance in the context of uh, developing a hydrogen uh, economy. Also, as you'll see, those are issues uh, uh, linked uh, with um, uh, with uh, 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 European Green Deal, but uh, 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 right now uh, we are uh, proposing uh, two new industrial alliances on semiconductors and on uh, 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 big data, cloud and edge uh, uh, technologies. 
Uh, and um, uh, once again, we need to find the right uh, balance there between uh, openness and principle and being uh, uh, restricted in duly uh, justified uh, cases that such uh, as, uh, for example, for defense or uh, security uh, grounds. Thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, just coming back to the COVID-19, which, of course, uh, we are all still in which we're still involved. Um, the issue of um, abolition of patents for vaccines, Vice President, uh, that is causing some difference of approach uh, between uh, the US uh, and uh, EU. And of course, uh, the suggestion which came from India, which uh, you've had discussions with recently. But uh, what is the European view on the uh, question of patent abolition? Yeah, well, uh, uh, as we had been um, uh, uh, clear from the very beginning, we are uh, open to discuss this US uh, proposal and uh, see how exactly it leads to the aim uh, which we want to achieve, which is a uh, boost in a global vaccine production and uh, uh, improved availability of vaccines to uh, developing uh, countries. Uh, there, of course, are number of elements which needs to be uh, discussed, in, including uh, export uh, restrictions. Uh, for example, EU is exporting almost half of our vaccine uh, production. This is unfortunately not the case with uh, countries like United States or United uh, Kingdom. So we need to discuss actually how uh, these countries are also contributing to accessibility of vaccines in uh, developing uh, uh, countries. And, uh, and we need to see uh, uh, what is a practical way of uh, improving global vaccine uh, production. And there uh, we uh, see that uh, uh, the licensing arrangements are needed between, uh, between companies who have the necessary know-how and uh, companies uh, um, which can provide additional manufacturing uh, capacity. So it's not only about uh, intellectual property rights, it's also about having necessary uh, know-how, having necessary inputs to be able uh, to speedily boost um, uh, global vaccine uh, production through uh, voluntary uh, licensing agreements or as uh, uh, we have been flagging already uh, 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 since these discussions started, if necessary also through uh, compulsory uh, uh, license. But in any case, we are uh, ready uh, to um, uh, uh, to discuss with the US and in, expect, uh, in a sense expecting them to come in with more uh, elaborate uh, uh, outline of their uh, proposal and how it uh, uh, helps to achieve the uh, boost of global vaccine production. Thank you, Vice President. Yes, obviously production of vaccines and any um, uh, freeing up of that is obviously a, a very much a discussion uh, that's uh, uh, of considerable interest at the moment. Um, I have um, uh, a question uh, from um, IIA economics researcher, uh, which is um, what kind of new fiscal policy instruments will be considered as part of the stability and growth pact review? And will the commission consider a quote golden rule uh, tying a deficit spending exceeding structural budget balances to investment projects. That's definitely a question from an economist to an economist. Yeah, well, uh, as regards uh, the review of EU uh, fiscal rules, um, uh, we have for a time being suspended our uh, public uh, consultation uh, uh, to focus on immediate uh, crisis uh, uh, issues. Uh, but uh, we were uh, clear that uh, after the crisis, we will, so to say, uh, continue our uh, public uh, consultation, uh, gather necessary uh, inputs and come uh, forward with uh, uh, proposals on a possible way uh, uh, forward. So uh, at some of the uh, uh, issues which we are looking at, uh, first of all, uh, uh, there has been a good input already pre-COVID from the European Fiscal Board outlining uh, several ideas. First, on the simplification of rules and moving away from uh, 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 directly unobservable indicators such as uh, output gaps and structural balances and moving instead for an expenditure benchmark with a debt anchor because expenditure is something which governments can directly uh, control. Uh, um, 
and uh, uh, another uh, proposal for consideration by European Fiscal uh, uh, Board was what they were calling limited golden rule. So we are also looking at uh, this also now in a context of post-COVID uh, economic uh, recovery. Uh, but uh, in a sense, we do not now uh, want to prejudge the debate. We will uh, reopen and finish our public consultation, gather the views of uh, member states of different uh, stakeholders, uh, and then uh, see uh, what is the way uh, forward. But already now, uh, it's important to emphasize that uh, building consensus will be important. Uh, 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 because we know that the views of um, uh, 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 of on 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 the fiscal rules tend to vary, so we need to avoid the situation where we are just uh, 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 getting into some kind of divisive uh, uh, discussion. That indeed, uh, if we are opening uh, the fiscal rules, we can be uh, confident that we are landing them in a better place where we are now. Thank you, Vice President. Do you see challenges in this? Are opinions very divided or are you hopeful that uh, we will see relatively early results in this area? Uh, well, uh, uh, I would say that remains to be uh, seen. We know that uh, normally it's not an easy uh, discussion on the uh, fiscal rules. Yes. So uh, uh, at the same time, uh, we uh, manage uh, as the EU to, to react in a uh, coordinated way and in a uh, uh, spirit of European solidarity to the crisis. So uh, uh, hopefully we can build momentum also around uh, uh, those uh, uh, new uh, fiscal uh, rules uh, and uh, so to say, uh, find the right uh, balance between uh, stimulating the economic recovery and uh, ensuring uh, fiscal sustainability. Thank you. Um, I, I get a sense from uh, what you say that uh, the COVID, while initially there may have been difficulties, that it has uh, improved cooperation uh, between uh, members of the EU and that that, that is, is positive for going forward with whatever policies need to be implemented. Uh, well, uh, as regards the uh, cooperation between EU uh, countries, uh, indeed, I think it's very uh, positive that we were able to uh, reach uh, agreements on uh, major uh, economic stimulus packages at the EU level. And with Next Generation EU, for the first time, we are using the approach that uh, this recovery package will be based on uh, common EU borrowing in the uh, financial uh, markets. So, uh, 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 of course, now what is uh, important is uh, implementation. So to make uh, sure that uh, uh, member states uh, prepare or have prepared uh, uh, good quality recovery and resilience plans, uh, because our idea is uh, not only uh, to ensure uh, economic recovery, but also use this massive fiscal stimulus to facilitate the green and digital transformations of our economy. That's why they are green and digital mainstreaming targets for uh, member states recovery and resilience plans, and also strengthen the resilience of uh, uh, EU economy. And that's why the link with the uh, country specific recommendations uh, uh, within the European semester is very important. Yes, as you had mentioned earlier, uh, this is a huge task that's underway at the moment for the Commission to examine the, uh, the recovery plans, uh, which uh, Member States are submitting at the moment. Perhaps I could move, uh, Vice President, to the, um, the strategic um, uh, partnership agreements. Um, I have a question here from Thomas Conway, a politics and economics student at Trinity College, and he asks, uh, that the EU launched its EU Africa strategic partnership last year. And to what extent have EU Africa trade relations developed since? And is there any prospect for establishing a free trade deal with the African continent free trade area? Yeah. Uh, okay, uh, so uh, first on EU-Africa uh, strategic uh, partnership, it's reflected also in our new EU uh, trade uh, policy. Uh, we uh, actually, in terms of new engagements, uh, we identify uh, Africa and EU neighborhood as uh, priority areas for, uh, uh, for a further engagement. 
uh, as regards uh, our uh, 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 trade uh, cooperation with uh, Africa, it uh, continues to uh, develop and EU is a main uh, Africa's trading uh, partner. So we uh, continue uh, to uh, develop our economic partnership agreements, which are uh, regional economic partnership agreements, or in some cases we have uh, bilateral negotiations with uh, uh, some African uh, countries. And uh, as regards, uh, specifically the question of continent-to-continent uh, uh, -continent, uh, negotiations, uh, first of all, we are providing uh, lots of support for this uh, uh, initiative of uh, uh, continental free trade area in uh, Africa. So we are uh, providing both uh, uh, technical and financial and political support to this uh, work. Uh, and uh, certainly uh, will be uh, uh, willing to uh, negotiate continent-to-continent uh, -continent, uh, free trade area, uh, but we see this uh, more as a longer-term uh, perspective. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, Vice President, you were in Porto uh, at the last weekend, uh, where you had um, a virtual meeting uh, with the Indian Prime Minister, and uh, that we see that um, the New Delhi trade talks are being resuscitated. And I want to ask you post uh, Porto uh, discussions uh, where a very wide range of issues for these talks uh, were laid out on the table. Are you optimistic uh, about such an agreement? Obviously, the geopolitical uh, situation has changed uh, and it was different from the earlier talks, which uh, uh, were going on for many years, but in effect came to nothing. But are you optimistic for uh, these present talks? Yeah, well, uh, first of all, it's a uh, uh, very uh, positive outcome from the EU-India uh, summit that leaders uh, confirmed uh, that we are relaunching our uh, uh, negotiations on a deep and comprehensive uh, free trade uh, agreement between EU and uh, India. Uh, well, indeed, we hope that there is a new momentum now, political and also geopolitical uh, uh, momentum, and we see uh, more uh, willingness uh, on uh, India's side to engage actively and actually uh, make a progress on those uh, negotiations. Uh, in fact, we uh, agreed to launch um, uh, 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 three negotiations. So we start negotiations on free trade agreement, uh, start uh, negotiations on a separate investment protection agreement, and also uh, start negotiations on agreement on protection of geographical uh, indications. Uh, well, of course, as regards the free trade agreement and uh, uh, investment agreement, we see that, of course, they need to be uh, mutually uh, reinforcing. Uh, and uh, so we hope that indeed uh, there is now more uh, positive uh, momentum and uh, a willingness to move uh, forward. Of course, as we outline also to Indian uh, side is that uh, there is uh, to, gen to uh, 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 generate uh, this uh, momentum. There is also important that uh, uh, we address uh, market access issues, some of which are longstanding market uh, access issues, because this will help to create uh, the right uh, political uh, uh, environment for moving forward with those talks. Thank you for that. And um, uh, coming from Ireland, I suppose, uh, what we would be also interested in, where you see the Mercosur agreement at the moment? Uh, yeah, as regards uh, EU uh, Mercosur uh, agreement, uh, I would uh, like to underline that in uh, terms of uh, uh, tariff uh, reductions, uh, uh, it's actually the largest uh, 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 free trade agreement EU has ever uh, negotiated. Uh, 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 if I'm not mistaken, uh, the uh, tariff reductions uh, value was somewhere around 3 billion euros a, a year, but I'm now kind of uh, uh, quoting this figure from uh, from Hart, so <laughs> uh, uh, worth uh, double checking, uh, but uh, so there is a large significant uh, uh, economic significance in this agreement. Uh, EU would also be uh, the first global partner having a trade agreement with uh, Mercosur, which is a large and quite protected market, so we would have substantial first mover uh, advantage. Uh, of course, we know that there are uh, concerns uh, related uh, 
uh, deforestation. Um, uh, actually, I now got the corrections uh, 4 billion euros uh, 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 in annual tariff reductions. Uh, so, uh, of course, we are uh, aware of the concerns uh, regarding uh, 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 deforestation and environmental record in uh, Mercosur countries, that's uh, notably in Brazil. That's why we are now engaging with Mercosur countries on additional competence concerning sustainability, uh, concerning respect to, of Paris Agreement and deforestation. And uh, 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 it's uh, clear that uh, to be able to successfully move towards uh, uh, Mercosur ratification, we need to address those uh, concerns. So the reactions from the Mercosur uh, countries are uh, broadly speaking, uh, positive, but of course, uh, we need to negotiate the exact nature of the uh, commitments and its uh, uh, legal uh, form. So this is a work which is currently ongoing in a parallel with a technical finalization of agreement, legal scrubbing, and all other things uh, which uh, we need uh, to do. Just a short question on that, uh, Vice President. Would you see it when COVID, which is obviously uh, some blocking some uh, developments at the moment, would you see these negotiations on Mercosur moving forward fairly swiftly um, when the COVID, worst of COVID is over? Uh, well, uh, it's now, uh, you know, somewhat uh, uh, difficult uh, to say uh, uh, or predict exact pace of those uh, uh, negotiations because uh, the uh, EU Mercosur uh, 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 trade agreement negotiations are concluded. So now, in a sense, we are coming back and saying, okay, now we expect some uh, commitments on top of this as regards uh, uh, sustainability. So, uh, 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 as I said, uh, we still need to discuss with Mercosur countries both the scope and exact legal nature of those uh, uh, commitments. Uh, so uh, I, I cannot now give you exact uh, 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 timeline. It may take uh, some uh, time, uh, uh, but uh, uh, in general, uh, there is acknowledgement from uh, Mercosur uh, countries that uh, these uh, commitments are needed if we are to uh, move uh, forward with successful ratification. Thank you for that. And then just uh, bending back towards quite a specific uh, question on um, EU steel safeguards, and again from um, the Melix Market Insight, Joanna Sapinski. On the EU steel safeguard, uh, is the EU going to extend the steel safeguard that is expiring on June the 30th as requested by the steel industry? Well, this is uh, something which we are uh, currently uh, investigating. So uh, there was a request of number of uh, member states to do this uh, uh, investigation on uh, possible extension of steel safeguards. So uh, uh, something which we are currently uh, undertaking and uh, uh, gathering all the necessary inputs, all the necessary evidence and will base our uh, uh, decision on our proposal for member states on this, uh, on uh, the base of uh, evidence uh, which has been uh, gathered. So we had uh, received uh, uh, actually a large uh, number of inputs, if I'm not mistaken, more than 300 inputs. So now we are uh, doing the assessment. Uh, so we expect uh, uh, this uh, uh, decision being somewhere well, late uh, May, presumably, but uh, we cannot now tell exact uh, uh, date. So decision is not taken at a current stage. Of course, we need to uh, see the interest of steel industry. We will need to see also interest of downstream uh, industries. And there is one factor which we need to keep in mind, which we are also currently assessing, that if we extend uh, steel safeguards for longer than three years, which would be the case, uh, it means that uh, uh, EU is opening itself uh, to retaliation by third countries, because then uh, third countries, which are affected by these steel uh, safeguards, can uh, retaliate, imposing additional tariffs on EU uh, goods. And uh, 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 some uh, 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 countries which are concerned, so the two biggest uh, uh, countries uh, concerned in terms of import uh, values are uh, uh, Turkey and uh, Russia. 
uh, had, uh, in a sense, uh, made uh, some uh, noises on this potential retaliation, including uh, in uh, steel sector concerning steel products themselves. So we need to do also this evaluation of the economic impact uh, uh, on steel industry or potentially on any other industry, because in a sense, so countries are free to retaliate in whichever sector they uh, decide. Uh, uh, so what is potential impact of this uh, retaliation? Thank you for that very in insightful answer and, and the detail given. Um, our Director General asks you, uh, bringing us closer to home, uh, he asks, Michael Collins is asking, saying the EU is actively looking, the UK is actively looking for new trade deals post-Brexit. Do you see that the UK has any extra advantages in these negotiations in not being a member of the EU? Uh, well, uh, in a sense, that's exactly uh, the uh, reason why uh, UK now has uh, to actively look for a new uh, trade uh, deals because uh, uh, as a, a member of the EU and a member of the customs union, the uh, UK was uh, covered uh, by EU uh, free trade uh, agreements and EU has a uh, best network of uh, uh, free trade uh, uh, agreements in the world. So what UK is now uh, seeking, uh, uh, in a sense, is uh, to the extent uh, possible uh, replicate this uh, 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 network of uh, free trade agreements. It comes uh, from the very nature uh, of uh, uh, a decision of leaving not only the EU, but also the, the customs uh, union. Uh, so I don't think there is um, any uh, like uh, major uh, uh, advantage because uh, uh, from the EU side, we have the most comprehensive network of uh, free trade agreements in the world. And currently it's not available to the UK. So UK needs in a sense to try to replicate as much as UK can. Thank you. And uh, Vice President, just uh, a last question then on, on the, the huge area of the WTO and the reform. In your trade policy review and uh, in, in discussions, uh, you, lay great, you lay great emphasis on uh, the, um, the EU determination to bring about reform of the WTO. What are, what are you proposing in that regard with the, with the W to strengthen the WTO? Because of course, huge areas uh, outside the uh, trade agreements um, that the EU has are actually dealt with um, uh, in the, through WTO rules. So what do you feel just finally is necessary to bring about with the WTO? Yeah, well, as regards uh, WTO reform, indeed our new trade policy strategy was accompanied by detailed WTO reform uh, proposal. And we uh, think that we need a reform pretty much in all uh, branches of uh, the uh, WTO uh, work. So as regards negotiating function, as regards uh, monitoring and deliber deliberation function, and also as regards uh, dispute uh, uh, settlement, and probably a restoration of the uh, functioning of the uh, this settlement body would be the most uh, uh, urgent uh, issue, uh, but uh, we also more broadly need to bring the rule book of WTO, so to say, into 21st century, so that it's able uh, to respond uh, to the uh, current uh, challenges, including the uh, green and digital transformation of the economy, and it's also better able to uh, respond to some uh, new or not so new already economic uh, developments and uh, shifts uh, uh, coming, uh, for example, from uh, uh, social economic model of uh, uh, China, because uh, current uh, WTO rulebook is not uh, very well, uh, 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 well, it's, it's, it's not very good at addressing these kind of uh, challenges. So it's uh, actually quite a uh, comprehensive reform which we are proposing uh, and uh, we believe that um, we now have a good momentum for this with a new WTO director general with a new uh, administration in the US that we could really uh, uh, move forward and uh, uh, so to say bring the WTO rulebook into the 21st century. Thank you. Andri, a very final question, and I will put it because it relates to Latvia. Uh, and 
Uh, it's a question from um, as our Dara Moriarty, who's a student of political economy. And he's asking you, with coming from an Eastern uh, expansion member state, uh, what are your thoughts about the Eastern states and how uh, they have fitted in into the whole European scene and whether the external incentive model for building a common EU identity works well and does your portfolio have a role in building a broader collective uh, identity? Yeah, well, uh, uh, as regards uh, EU uh, uh, en enlargement and how it has uh, worked, I would say uh, all in all, it has uh, worked uh, uh, remarkably uh, well. Uh, and we had seen a, a strong degree of uh, convergence uh, of uh, uh, GDP uh, per capita between, uh, as I well, uh, so say old EU member states and uh, new EU member states. Of course, this process of convergence is still ongoing. It's important that uh, it continues to be uh, supported at the EU uh, level. And uh, uh, it's uh, uh, definitely the case both in the next multi-annual financial framework and also uh, uh, it was reflected when we were designing the EU economic uh, recovery uh, plan. Uh, so, uh, 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 economically, uh, uh, I would say that uh, Central Eastern European countries managed to integrate uh, uh, quite well, and also EU is uh, uh, um, uh, 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 also uh, EU is actually quite appreciated among uh, the uh, citizens and the support for EU is quite high, I would say, across the Central Eastern European countries and also trust for EU institutions and for Euro, for example, is quite high. So uh, all in all, uh, uh, those are positive uh, developments. Of course, it's not without its uh, challenges and its uh, problems, and there is a, a constant work to uh, address them. but. Uh, 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 I, I think uh, economically uh, it was very important, and I think uh, for many uh, uh, Central East European countries, including for Latvia, it was also a strategic choice. Where do you want to belong? Do you want to belong to the Western uh, democratic world or uh, somewhere in a grey zone between uh, EU and uh, Russia? And uh, I would say that Central Eastern Europe's answer to this was very clear. Yes, thank you. Um, Vice President, if I could just trespass on your patience for one more question, which has come from YouTube and from the Irish uh, Times. And uh, it's, have you any message uh, for the uh, DUP and leadership candidates and those who, appro who oppose the Northern Ireland Protocol? Uh, you spoke about it earlier. Uh, any message uh, that you would leave with us uh, on the Northern Ireland Protocol for those in Northern Ireland? Well, uh, 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 something which I said already in the introductory uh, remarks is that we are uh, from the EU side uh, very uh, committed to the uh, successful implementation of Northern Ireland uh, Protocol and ensuring that uh, there is no hard border in uh, 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 Ireland of Ireland and uh, we will uh, continue uh, to uh, ensure this and of course it requires joint effort of the EU and the UK for this to uh, uh, function uh, smoothly. Thank you. So, Vice President, thank you very much indeed. We greatly appreciate the attention you have devoted to, uh, to um, your initial remarks and also for answering the questions so comprehensively and uh, in such an informative manner. Uh, we wish you well uh, in your very wide portfolio, and I think you can be assured certainly of the support of the Institute, and we do hope uh, that we will see you in person sometime uh, in the not too distant future. But in the meantime, thank you most sincerely for joining us, uh, and uh, we wish you well. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs>